I'd like to welcome our next presenter who has spent the last 35 years involved in the zoological, agricultural, and conservation communities. He's come all the way from Tenerife where he serves as the director of one of the greatest bird destinations in the world, which is Laura Parque. His lifelong passion for birds has given him a world of travel and experience. So can we please give a warm welcome to our friend, Dr. David Wall. Thank you, Mark. This is on, I presume, yep. It's a great pleasure to be here. I haven't been here for the last four years. Um, very nice to see old friends, acquaintances, and to enjoy the very nice environment that the AFA Annual Convention represents. Um, I'd like to thank, therefore, the AFA very much for inviting me to speak at this year's convention and also, of course, to the Laura Park Foundation for being my sponsor to be here. And uh, for this talk, and I've got another talk tomorrow, but for this one, um, I'd like just to give you an update on some of the natural and um, assisted uh, reproduction that's taken place recently within the Laura Park Foundation uh, in Tenerife, uh, Spain. But before I do that, of course, I I must mention that our next international pirate convention, the eighth in a series, one every four years, and the next one is coming up in September, at the end of September of next year, and we have all sorts of goodies uh, in the preparation for you. So please, if you can make it, it will be a great pleasure to see you there, and we can guarantee that you'll have not just a great speaker program, but also a great social program. Okay, well, coming on then to, to what I'm going to say today, um, I do need to give you a bit of a background to the parrot collection and its management in the Laura Park Foundation. Um, for those of you who already know the, the collection, um, please um, bear with me while I go through this quite quickly. Um, and then we'll get on to some of the recent breeding successes and I put here that made us happy. Um, some of those are of uh, threatened uh, uh, or endangered species, but others are not. They're just, they're, they're just species that we had a problem with. We got through that barrier and therefore um, we were very pleased with the result. And I think that um, there's something for everybody um, in that. And then finally, to speak a little bit about research and practice in the evaluation of uh, the sperm of parrots, and the technique of artificial insemination. Okay, well, for those of you who don't know, we have Tenerife in the Canary Islands, Canary Islands here, way south of the rest of Spain, which is here, and Laura Park and the Laura Park Foundation you find in the middle of the north coast of the island of Tenerife. And it has a great climate, very, very good for keeping and breeding parrots. Um, very little annual variation in temperatures. Um, those temperatures that you see there are at uh, sea level or near to sea level, because as you can see in the winter, we get snow on the, on the peak of the volcano, uh, which I hasten to add is not active. Uh, the last eruption was 1909, um, and we're not expecting another one soon. And it's at 28 degrees north, which is the same, um, the same latitude as Miami. And of course, the park that is open to the public is the Laurel Park itself. This is a park that started off solely with parrots, but has um, over the years developed um, a, quite a diverse collection of different kinds of animals. And it's a very green area. Uh, full of palm trees, full of banana trees, surrounded by banana plantations. Um, nestling within all of those palms, you'll find a variety of attractions, a variety of different birds, uh, mammals, and other groups. Here we've got a couple of, um, of Eastern African gray, uh, Eastern African crown cranes. We've got birds inside as well in the Penguinarium. This is the world's biggest um, penguin exhibit with five different species and they're in the Antarctic light cycle and uh, temperatures. And we have an aquarium with the, uh, with the shark tunnel and lots of different um, aquatic and uh, saltwater exhibits. And then we get on to bigger things, the mammals, of course, uh, big cats like this jaguar, 
gorillas. We have a, a bachelor group of gorillas. We have seven individuals. And the biggest mammal kept in captivity of all, the orcas. But of course, you're interested in most in the parrots and the Par Laura Park Foundation collection because the collection is owned by the Laura Park Foundation and not by the, the private company that runs the park is uh, currently about 3,800 specimens of over 350 different species and subspecies. So it's the world's largest, most diverse parrot collection. Now, keeping or exhibiting them rather in Laura Park used to be done only this way, that is that there were a series of aviaries with a different species or subspecies in each aviary. These happen to be for Amazons. But we're gradually moving away from that so that here you see uh, relatively new lorry aviaries where we've got groups of mixed species. These are all young birds. There are no nest boxes. So in that way we minimize any conflicts that potentially could arise. We've also been doing the, the same with macaws. This is how we originally had this big macaw aviary. Only with blue-throated macaws we had 70 individuals in that uh, aviary actually. But now it's changed and we have a mixed group of macaws, including hyacinths, leers, <coughs> uh, scarlets, uh, green wings, blue and gold, blue-throated, down to blue-headed blue macaws. And then this is the biggest aviary that we have of all. This is called Katandra treetops. Katandra means uh, song of the birds in Aboriginal language, and treetops means that the visitors can get up into the treetops on a, on a kind of suspended br bridge. Um, and get really in amongst the birds that are flying around in the canopy and that's been a great success. You can see birds like this, the purple bellied lorry in that particular enclosure. Okay, well that's Laura Park, but about a mile and a half away up the hill is the breeding center of the Laura Park Foundation. Um, very close and of course therefore on the map in the same place. And we have, whoops, excuse me. And we have <clears throat> basically two main areas in the breeding center. We have these aviaries covered by a very fine dark mesh, which gives a more subdued lighting and a, and a more humid environment. And that's mainly for the birds that you would, the species that you would find more in enclosed forest environments. And then we've got the more open uh, mesh here, which gives much more uh, light, much more sunlight. Um, and it's a drier environment, microclimate, and that's for the birds, for the birds that come from more open areas like open woodland and savanna. And this is a view where you can see the netting. <coughs> Excuse me. The netting means that if a bird escapes out of the aviary, uh, it hasn't gone for good and the keepers can catch it up. And also it keeps out um, pest species, notably uh, pigeons, domestic pigeons that, that could bring in diseases. And this is a view down one of the aisles. These are aviaries that go right down to the ground in this case. Um, and the substrate is a kind of a porous volcanic gravel, which is very uh, easy to keep clean um, and suits us very well. And of course it is available on the island. And we have this netting up here, which we put in the summer in the, in, under the mesh that, that is more open. And that is really to protect the nest boxes that you, that you see here and the, and the food bowls which are in here uh, from the effects of the sun. Uh, you can see we grow a lot of vegetation. In fact, the aviaries are separated by a very dense vegetation and we have a lot of um, citrus trees, guavas, papayas, and all of these fruits we can feed to the, to the parrots. We have some aviaries which are suspended aviaries and those are for the smaller body species, of course, and we have other aviaries which are huge, and these are used for a variety of different reasons, and I'll explain some of those in a minute. We have some quite big breeding aviaries, much bigger than the standard, which we use for what we would call special species, in this case for a pair of pescates parrots that you see here. Okay, optimal keeping of parrots. <clears throat> I don't think any of these things will be a big surprise to you. We try to have uh, as large an aviary as possible according to the to the body size of the species concerned. Of course, to, to really focus on keeping the most hygienic conditions possible. 
to have enrichment for all of our birds to the maximum possible, to make sure the nutrition is, is optimal in as many cases as we can manage, to give the best possible medical care and to, at the end of the day, give possibilities for reproduction. So hygiene, while this occurs, of course, on a, on a daily basis, on a weekly and a monthly basis, according to the to the the elements that we're looking at and um, the importance of doing things on these those different cycles, but of course the keepers are going to be uh, cleaning in the aviaries every day. Although they don't have to go very far into the aviaries because the way we've got it set up, most of the uh, food remains drop outside of the aviary, and I'll show you that in a minute. In enrichment, we have a variety of ways of enriching the environments for the parrots um, as you can see with these thick built parrots and um, using logs swinging on chains in this particular case uh, the gray parrot that you see over here we've suspended a, a decaying log which has got lots of beetles in it um, which is again a great thing for the the parrots to chew on and discover those uh, those things in the log and of course what we would consider to be more traditional toys especially made for enrichment these being made of, uh, of, of kind of, of cord and, and wood nutrition um, we feel it's very important to feed a variety of different uh, a wide variety of different fruits and vegetables um, alongside other things the fruit and vegetable mixture we will give to the different species in the morning feed which takes place at about eight o'clock in the morning and then in the afternoon, at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we'll feed uh, a dried seed mixture, sometimes with, um, with a cooked um, mixed bean uh, supplement as well. And we have uh, different seed mixtures for different groups like macaws, um, Amazons, uh, cockatoos, uh, African grey parrots. And we also feed millet sprays to quite a lot of the, uh, the smaller species. Um, and nuts in particular feature quite largely for some of the, uh, the macaw species especially. And I mentioned that most of the food remains fall outside of the cage. Well, uh, here you can see that we have a platform and in that platform we can insert uh, the water and food bowls very easily and the, the, the parrots feed mainly on the shelf and the remains drop out. And so it's a very efficient way to be able to keep hygienic conditions. But of course, we don't just put food in the bowls and nothing else. We also, depending on the species, put uh, food in other places, in particular uh, fruits distributed around the perching that might be, um, or it will be, in the cage. Uh, very hard nuts for our species like the palm cockatoo. These are figs. Figs, of course, for different species of fig parrots, like this Desmarest's fig parrot. Chicken for these guys, Gangan cockatoos. And this is an insect slurry which we give to Kias. And we give an artificial nectar to all of the lorry species. Uh, and you can see a group of, a family group of whisked lorries on this uh, nectar bowl in this photo. But we also give um, a real nectar. We give flowers. We've got uh, lots of hibiscus flowers growing in the breeding center and around the breeding center and we give hibiscus flowers uh, to the lorries as well and they, they, they break straight into the nectaries at the base of the flower and take the, the real nectar and they also eat the pollen at the other end of the flower. This is a red-necked uh, red lorry. And then this is the famous Laura Park cake, uh, the very secret recipe Laura Park uh, cake, uh, which we've had for a long time. It, really has the same function of as a as a as a pellet or an extruded item um, in terms of nutritional balance but uh, we give it to all of the species and it's very palatable and they do enjoy it and we also feed um, very soft fresh uh, maize or corn uh, to our pears that are feeding young um, because we find that this is a great st stimulant if you like uh, both for the for the adults and also for the chicks we have our own we make our own mineral block which you see here that's always in the cages and over here you can see our reverse osmosis unit which we use for all of the water 
um, for drinking and also to go in the shower units which are over all of the cages um, which we use to give the birds the opportunity to have a shower every day. And that particular item brings me on to the next point about medical care. We have uh, a team of three veterinarians and two vet techs and two laboratory technicians who are looking after the para collection, but they're also looking after the collection of animals in Laurel Park. And with that team, we, we of course, focus on prevention. Uh, preventative medicine is, is very, very important in making sure that the health of the collection is optimal. Um, but things do go wrong, of course, and so we have to have interventions. Um, here, I think they're doing the trimming of a, of a beak. Um, and we have, our, as I said, we have our laboratory, and it's a, uh, we have some state-of-the-art uh, equipment to enable us to do quite a lot of the, the viral and, uh, and um, bacterial analyses on site. And then finally, we come on to reproduction possibilities. And of course, you need to know that you've got a pair of birds so that you have the chance to, to, uh, to have good breeding. And that's OK if you've got a dimorphic species such as this um, blue rumped parrot from Southeast Asia. But that's not always the case, of course. And so um, most of the species we're talking about are monomorphic, where we've actually got to do a, a sexing. And we, we do our sexing by endoscopy because the veterinarians are very experienced in that, but they also are able to do a very careful check of all of the organs when they're going in. And so it's not just um, to sex the bird, but it's also to check the general health. That's a very quick and simple operation. And then we've hopefully got the sex uh, right, and we can put the, uh, the, di the different colored bands on the different sexes. And that can be confirmed with behavioral observations afterwards to make sure that they're doing the right thing behaviorally as well. Also, the right kind of um, nesting cavity. That's very important. We give them, in each aviary, we have more than one nest box. We're giving them choice. Here you see um, what I would call traditional vertical um, boxes, but we can have lots of different configurations. We do have lots of con different configurations, and we may have different configurations of box within the same aviary. I say within, actually, they're, they're not inside the aviary. As you can see, they're, they're mounted on the outside of the aviary, so they can be easily checked without having to disturb the birds. So here we've got a diagonal style of box, which seems to suit the golden conures very well. We get a good um, production uh, arising out of their use of that diagonal style of box. But also we will use natural materials. We, we may use a, a, a trunk like this, but we can't, in, in the island, we can't get too many of these. They're not uh, very available, but palm logs are, and so we have many more palm logs for different species. You, you would have seen in that photo of the, of the pescades pirates that we actually give them palm logs. We, we may give them three or four different palm logs within the same aviary and they choose which one they like best and then they start to excavate it. Um, was that the next one? Yes, that was the next one. And then there are certain peculiarities such as if we have a bird that has a history of laying eggs off the perch and we know that this is an important species for us, then we put these up when we know that this bird might be likely to lay. And in this case, we've actually saved a couple of eggs and they've been fertile and we've actually um, artificially incubated the eggs and, and raised the young. So um, it is a useful trick from time to time. But we hope that the birds get on with it and they do it themselves. And here, it, it, this has happened in this case with these blue-headed macaws and this pair with their, with their recently fledged young. But that's not always the case. Things, as I say, do go wrong. And so we, we uh, do have to hand rear. And in some cases, we will deliberately decide to hand rear birds. And we've got what we call the baby station where the hand rearing takes place. And we've got some very experienced uh, hand rearers uh, with years of experience. And um, because of the size of our collection, we're producing um, over a 1,000 young birds every year. And about 60% of the birds are parent reared at the moment. So there's quite a few birds that are still going through the baby station. So those staff are very experienced. Um, so uh, they get big, of course. And here you've got the macaws, uh, a group of macaws in a, a big tub, in a big plastic tub. And they're in the phase where they're 
really reaching independence and they will then go out to this area which is our nursery or kindergarten and there they start to learn social um, skills and they start to gain in physical strength um, but those, those social skills really have to be developed it, it, it is a bit of a bun fight sometimes um, but this is this is where they start and then once they've they've um, had a period in here and they're looking as though they're doing fine then they go back up to the breeding center into these very big cages these very big aviaries that I spoke to you about where they then really build up their flight muscles they build up uh, physical strength as well as continuing with social skills here we've got a group of blue-throated macaws but we can have groups of um, very many different kinds of species in those big aviaries um, <clears throat> sometimes we do fostering and sometimes we do cross fostering in this case um, you can see that this young uh, hyacinth has been reared by this very experienced pair of green wing macaws um, that doesn't happen very often but um, but we do have the chance to do it from time to time and um, and we have pairs that are very experienced that will uh, do it very well okay that's really the background to um, to our collection and our management but now I want to talk about those uh, recent breeding successes which we, uh, we we got a kick out of and the first one is to do uh, with the yellow tail black cockatoo um, this um, is a species that's very rarely bred successfully outside of Australia as far as we know there are only two successful breeders in Europe and the Laurel Park Foundation is one of those and so it's a species that that um, needs help it needs to be boosted if you like uh, its problem is that as a species in captivity in Europe at least it produces a lot of infertile eggs and there is some there are some issues with the behavior or uh, inappropriate behavior of hand-reared males we haven't had um, a problem with behavior but we've had a, a problem with infertile eggs and so what we decided to do was take a technique that is well known has been used for well for decades as far as I know um, in aviculture with other groups which is to trim the vent feathers and um, in trimming the vent feathers it, it may be that you make a compensation for a buildup of, of um, fat of subcutaneous fat around the vent um, we haven't in fact we, we we looked carefully at our birds and we could we couldn't see that that was obviously the case although with some some birds you can see that it's obviously the case but anyway it is we decided to trim the vent feathers and as a result we got uh, this so we we got we got fertile eggs and we we got uh, successful hatching um, we we did the male um, and we got two of them um, and we decided um, because we weren't sure that this pair was when I say that they were behaviorally okay we weren't sure that they were going to rear the, 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 the young so we we decided not to take any chances and we hand reared the young uh, which are quite delicate but uh, we hand reared them fine um, here you can see uh, this this guy growing up and as, as soon as we could we put in these wooden these low wooden perches um, for the toes to 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 uh, to start to develop the proper grip because we felt that that might be an issue um, so we we didn't want to take any chances and we put these perches in and here you have here you have the two birds at their um, independent stage if you like they're just moving to the to the point where basically they're they're feeding uh, on solids by themselves um, and we don't actually have to uh, supplement them at all with any with any um, hand rearing food. The next one is the the red vented uh, cockatoo or Philippine cockatoo. This is a, a critically endangered species, of course, and there is a European um, endangered species program, uh, the equivalent of the the SSP over here in North America for that species. And uh, Laurel, Laurel Park Foundation is it was is in that, of course. Well, we had, uh, and it's not an easy species to breed, or, uh, at least not in Europe, as um, our experience is that it's not easy to breed. Um, and as a, as a species within Europe, um, the, the rate of hand rearing or the level of hand rearing it, it far exceeds parent rearing. Okay, well, we, we had a synchronized pair 
behaviorally well well synchronized and um and it was in an aviary with with uh, a couple of nest boxes with a single um, entrance and they were pr producing eggs but they weren't completing the cycle properly so uh, we had to do something here they are in that original aviary they are, they're at the front here near the food bowls um, you may notice something which is these panels we've got here these panels we started off putting them in the Philippine cockatoo aviaries but then now they extend right through all of the cockatoo aviaries because um, as many of you will know cockatoo males can be unpredictably aggressive to the females to the point where sometimes they'll kill females um, but putting up the panels means that if the female sees that the male is getting into that kind of behavior situa situation she can get out of his sight line and that really has to we have seen that that has calmed down the situation um, whereas um, before it would have been much more uh, dangerous they had a lot of noisy neighbors other cockatoo species real screeches and so we decided to put them into a quieter area and to give them a, a different kind of nest box and so we gave them a nest box with a double exit entry um, as you can see here um, within the aviary and this is the the nest box um, outside at the back of the aviary and that did the trick that seemed to be the right stimulus for them to complete their cycle and parent rear their own chicks and they all uh, fledged uh, perfectly we've also had some issues with uh, the blue street lorry um, we have a number of older pairs and there have been no previous breeding of those older pairs we had done some changes um, such as putting putting in this this l-shaped box that we felt might be more conducive to get them to breed um, th that hasn't worked up until now and uh, there's another species also which is the black lorry again we had um, a, a number of pairs which were uh, reasonable breeders originally but they declined to near zero um, and again we had given them the l-shaped boxes but we decided just to do something uh, different which was that we reduced the percentage of protein in the diet from 12 percent to eight percent and we increased the amount of enrichment uh, that we gave those pairs and lo and behold those two things together uh, kicked off um, the breeding in those two species or in those pairs of those two species that previously had declined or had never shown any breeding previously we also um, keep the European stud book for the Mount Apple lorry uh, Johnstone's lorry and uh, Again, we had a situation where the breeding started off fine and gradually it was declining. And you can see that kind of thing also in the Vini lorikeets, these Pacific lorikeets that have come into captivity and they started off um, really well and gradually they've declined over the years. Um, we, we, we thought about this syndrome called sibling fatigue where you, where you, uh, where you get birds deciding that they are not going to pair and breed with another bird because they've been raised with that bird and it may be that the bird they've been raised with actually is not a sibling at all it may be completely genetically unrelated but um, the the syndrome still applies and so we we were wondering if this was uh, the case in this particular species well what we did was we got a new uh, an unrelated male and this uh, arrested the breeding decline immediately um, they took off again um, and well we'll see we'll see what happens over the over the next few years um, but probably we'll introduce um, other other new blood also the blue-cheeked amazon this is a species that is rarely bred in captivity and it's one of those Amazon species that is prone to obesity and obesity has been linked at least in the Amazons to increased infertility of eggs the the inability to copulate properly well we had um, a pair that was producing fertile eggs but they were never able to rear their own young they, we always had to foster those young uh, onto uh, a different species a cross fostering uh, effect in this case 
So um, even though those um, those birds might not have been considered uh, obese, we what we did decided to do was to restrict the diet. We we put them on a diet. And we we restricted the items which were uh, high fat um, in the pre breeding period and fed those items very selectively um, during the um, incubation phase leading into the what we would hope rearing of young phase and that worked they they continued they didn't um, go off the boil like they had done before they continued um, to feed the young and we were very pleased with the result um, what you see here actually is not one of those young that's that's uh that's a young from the previous year that again that, from that pair that had to be hand reared uh, a closely related um, species is Amazona rodocoritha, the red-crowned uh, parrot, uh, also from the east of Brazil, and it has a completely different breeding system as far as we can see. We don't keep it um, as isolated pairs. We have tried to breed these birds as isolated pairs, but they haven't done very well. They do much better if they're in a group in a large communal aviary. In fact, we get double the production from that species than, than, than if they are kept as isolated pairs. And so uh, within that big aviary, as you might be able to see, we have small um, cages attached to the side, and each cage has an S-box, and those birds um, pair off, and then they establish their own little territories in those cages, which are um, adjoined to the main space of the communal aviary. Um, and they breed in those boxes. And this is the result. Um, and, but one thing that we have to think about, of course, is what might be the parentage. And so we, uh, we have to do a DNA analysis to know exactly uh, who was copulating with who. But, but by and large, in fact, they stay, stay true as pairs. And, and we separate them all at the end of November, and we put them all in different parts of the places in the breeding uh, station. And then we rejoin them um, at the uh, beginning of Febu uh, February, um, but by and large, they established their, their original pairs. The crimson-fronted uh, conure. Uh, this is a species which is a bit fussy about partners. Quite a lot of the green aratingas are, and this species had been a long time poor breeder for us. Um, we had older birds. So what we decided to do was take the older birds, put them into a communal aviary and let them make their own pairs through free mate choice. This again did the trick and we, we got them breeding uh, once again after many years of not being able to breed them. The thick bill parrot, again, uh, we seem to be only one of two centers in Europe that breed this species. Um, this is meant to be a loosely colonial species in the wild. We have tried to um, breed them in groups in, in our breeding uh, station, but we haven't had any success at, uh, at doing that way. Uh, so we keep them as separate pairs um, in this kind of aviary that you see here. <clears throat> and what we decided to do was increase the enrichment possibilities for them, putting in lots of pine cones, uh, lots of pine needles, uh, putting in these blocks of, of wood here, putting in these, these palm fruits uh, in this log here, stuffing this regularly with palm fruits and other things. So quite a lot of enrichment um, for, the, for those birds. Um, and that did the trick. We got, we got them to, uh, to breed. We have another very closely related species, which you probably know about, the maroon-fronted parakeet. Uh, you can see the difference here. I put in this this uh, one of the the thick bills for you to see the difference in the the color here. This is also a bigger bird. The maroon front is a bigger bird. It's got a much more uh, massive bill, despite the fact that the other one's called the thick bill parrot. Uh, we also keep them as single pairs. We've we've got three pairs. They haven't yet bred. We got them at the end of um, two thousand. Um, maybe they, they haven't bred yet anyway but we do pretty much the same that excuse me that we put in a lot of um, pine needles and pine cones for them 
And this is a, in the wild, this is a species that breeds in colonies on cliffs. And so what we've done is we've made this artificial uh, rock face for, for them. Let me go to the next slide so you can see that better. So we've got one cavity entrance here and we've got another one hidden in here. This hidden one comes out to this diagonal box here and the one at the back comes out to this uh, horizontal box here. Um, so uh, we've had a much more interest, since we built those uh, rock faces, we've had much more interest by those birds in going into those nesting cavities, but we actually haven't yet gotten them to lay eggs. But they did arrive as young birds, so maybe they've still got a way to go before they're ready to do that. Um, and this is mimicking what we did with the Lear's macaws. I've spoken here previously about this, uh, so enough, so some of you may know about this that the Lear's macaw also breeds in cliffs in Brazil, in red sandstone cliffs, and we made an artificial uh, rock face for them. This is it painted up, uh, again, with two, cavi two uh, uh, entries and two nesting cavities at the back, and this was pretty, very successful. We have now, since 2007, bred 26 Lear's macaws, and we have 30 uh, in total in the collection. And I think this is the last species um, of those examples. This is Emma's conure, uh, not, not a, an endangered species, but again, one that we were very pleased to, to do better with. We had a female mated separately with uh, two different males. Nothing was happening. So what we did was that we, we, we put the, the female in with those two males. Uh, that's, that, that's not those birds, but just to illustrate that we put them in together um, expecting for one pair to come out of that but we weren't thinking straight at the time um, because if we had been thinking straight of course then we would have realized that um, as this wonderful example shows here that increasingly we were seeing that Pirura, Pirura species are colonial breeders that they can have a number of different females and a number of different f males all going into the same box and all breeding uh, together and birds that were from the previous year, helping to feed the young of the next year, and so on. Uh, really quite a complex situation. This is the um, El Oro Conure, or El Oro Parakeet from the south of Ecuador, endemic to the south of Ecuador. The Laura Park Foundation has a project for that species. Um, and this is uh, what comes to mind now as to why we should have realized that those three uh, Emma's Conures were going to breed uh, together. Um, so that's what happened. Um, there we have the, the early result, and then this is the later uh, result of that breeding. When did I start? I started late, didn't I? Uh, okay, just to finish off this talk with the last section, which is about um, something that we're now doing um, a bit more than, than uh, hand rearing in assisted reproduction that we're looking at artificial insemination as a possibility for assisted reproduction for parrots in general but, but specifically certain cases come to mind that may be um, greatly aided by the use of this technique if we can get it to work properly um, but we also need a lot of research on the evaluation of sperm in parrots uh, to make sure that we can do the AI properly we're working in cooperation with the University of Gießen in Germany on this particular project. Uh, as you know, uh, artificial insemination is, well, I think there's everything to know about it in humans and in domestic uh, animals, which are of uh, great economic significance to us. Um, and in some exotics, particularly mammals, taking the technology over from the domestic species and in some bird groups and the best known I think are the birds of prey uh, and the cranes but very little is known relatively about the possibility to use this technique in parrots. There are quite a few things to consider with artificial insemination in, uh, in my paper I've given these in a bit more detail um, I, th I don't think it's necessary for me to read through this list uh, you, you'll be able to see what I've written. Um, it's just that you need to have a good reason to use artificial insemination, and you need to be aware that there are some possible negative uh, effects. So you need to, to
to go in to this technique with your eyes open about these things. Okay, well, there has been uh, some artificial insemination in the past of two species in particular, the budgerigar and the cockatiel. And semen uh, extraction, or being able to obtain semen, has been by a technique of massage of the abdomen of the, uh, of the male. And this has not involved any imprinting or training as compared to the birds of prey and the cranes, for example, where both males and females um, have been imprinted and or trained uh, to, to go through the right set of behaviors to be able to obtain sperm and also to inseminate females. In parrots, um, that's not being done, and it may be that mm, it, it may not be possible with parrots. We have to really think hard about that. Um, but that, that's worked for the budgerigar and for the cockatiel, but it, certainly that technique of abdominal massage certainly hasn't worked for large, uh, larger-bodied parrot species, such as this uh, green-winged macaw that you see here. Uh, that's in restraint um, for our new technique to be, to be used. And the new technique is to use electro-stimulation. So we have um, a little box, which, is, which has got a potentiometer, and the, 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 the voltage is very, very low, of course, but it can be varied. Um, and then there's a probe. Um, there's a cable coming out of the box, and there's a probe. And that probe is inserted into the, just into the entrance of the cloaca of the male, and the, the slight electrical stimulation is given. Um, and if you're lucky, then you will be able to uh, obtain sperm in that way. And this is the first application of e electro ejaculation or electro stimulation um, to parrots. And here, uh, this, these are images that have recently been published in Nature Online. So if you want to go to Nature Online and see that paper is there. Um, this is the end of, this is the probe that I spoke about. It has the two electrical contacts and um, sandwiched in between is a layer of plastic and this is the cable uh, going back. There's a, there's a slight opening here from which you can extract any sperm that, that has been obtained. But you can also ex obtain the sperm by, through capillary tubes. Um, here you can see three microscopic uh, images of a, a low of, of semen with a low concentration, a medium concentration and a high concentration of sperm. One of the species which we uh, did it on was the Spixus macaw. I hasten to add that most of the species we, we were using were, were commoner. Um, the Spixus macaw, well, we had an opportunity to do, to do it in one male, so we, so we did try it in that male, and we did get sperm. Here you can see that uh, taking place. Here is the, the presentation of a green wing macaw, that same green wing macaw uh, for um, obt obtaining the sperm. So that sperm has been obtained. It has to undergo a, an immediate evaluation microscopically to look at its viability, to look at the motility, uh, to look at the, uh, the number of uh, damaged cells, and so on. That's very, very, very important to know, um, the, to, 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 to get an, an estimation of the relative success that you might have in using that sperm to inseminate one or more females. This sample that you see here, uh, uh, this is taken obviously under the microscope, is on um, the sperm of a yellow-faced Amazon. And so there has to be insemination without any delay because the longer you leave it, the, the, the lower the viability of the sperm uh, you have. So. At the moment where we stand, you have to extract the sperm from the male and you have to have uh, an available female that you know is ready to lay the second egg, in fact, um, or, or maybe the third egg, um, and for you to inseminate at that moment. And because we, by and large, can't predict when the first egg is going to be laid, but we do know the, the interval for most species between laying of eggs, we can go for the second or the third egg, but we can never get that first egg. Um, and so you, the sperm is introduced into the, um, the, the cloaca or the uh, oviduct, as you can see, by means of the capillary tube. 
Okay, so our results were that we tried it on this, and these are the first results. This research is still going on. 151 species. We used two, 243 males, 344 attempts. Uh, almost 67% uh, of those were successful, and that's of 109 species. There was a difference between males that had been that had been responsible for previous fertile clutches and males that had been responsible for previously infertile clutches, and you can see the percentage difference there is quite marked. Um, the highest sperm concentration, just for you to know, is from a blue nate parrot, and uh, we we are getting very high concentrations also from uh, Eclectus um, as, a, as another example group. And with the artificial insemination, and these were all females that had previous infertile clutches, there were 11 females of 11 species, 64 inseminations, 34 eggs were laid as a result after the artificial insemination, 25 of those were fertile, and there were nine fertile eggs proven from artificial insemination because we had to use DNA analysis to look at uh, parentage, to look at paternity, to be able to establish that clearly. Um, so not many at the end, but it was successful, and this is the very beginning because we're going on uh, with, the, with the research. There were no negative effects on the birds, um, and I put this in here because within this here we had a pair of bonded female green-winged macaws. One of those females laid eggs. They were always infertile, of course. We inseminated her and of course she laid a fertile egg. Um, since we're getting on for time, I'll go through these very quickly. You need to look at a number of different uh, parameters and we're doing that now because we've now entered into another two years of evaluation especially of sperm and its characteristics um, we need to know all of these things very well if we're going to move uh, forward with this technique uh, looking at the differences in those over those parameters over time um, in this case sperm concentration and you'll see there's a difference quite a marked difference between the different groups um, which you might not have expected uh, and the last part of what we're doing is deep freezing, cryopreservation of sperm for, for long-term storage. Because as I said at the moment, we have to extract the sperm from the female, walk over from the male, sorry, walk over to the female and inseminate her very, very quickly. It would be much better if we opened our options in time and space to be able to um, inseminate females a long way away and also inseminate females um, when we when we know that that's the best time without having to worry about uh, the fact that we don't have viable sperm available. So you need to use um, a, a number of different things, uh, an appropriate semen diluent or extender, uh, you have to have a matching cryoprotectant, optimal cooling rate, all of these things uh, are very important to measure and this is the very detailed work that we're doing with the University of Gießen. Um, we're able to use a couple of different techniques for example fluorescence microscopy and eosin staining to separate between the dead uh, sperm and the, uh, and the living sperm. Um, and also we're looking at um, the, the effect of different diluents and cryoprotectants um, and, uh, and other uh, parameters on viability and motility of sperm in particular over time. We're looking at uh, the membrane integrity at electron microscope level to see um, what the differences might be between the uh, frozen sperm and the unfrozen sperm. And although this looks like something from uh, NASA, it's actually where sperms have penetrated the perivitelin membrane, the membrane that's surrounding the germinal disc, um, which is the target of the sperm, of course. And it seems that you have to have a lot of sperm um, going through the membrane, uh, one, only one of them, of course, will fuse with the with the female um, uh, uh, pronucleus, but you s have to have quite a lot of sperm penetrating the membrane for um, proper um, fusion and subsequent development. And I hope that this technique is going to produce lots of wonderful birds, particularly uh, like this uh, Inca cockatoo that you see here. Thank you very much and hope to see you all at our convention next year.